Okay, so for today, um, we will look at the reign of King John and uh, the very famous document uh, known as Magna Carta. Does anyone know what Magna Carta means in English? That's not a difficult uh, question. The Great Charter, okay. And it doesn't mean, kind of, oh, that's a great charter. What a great charter that was. It means it's a big, it's a significant charter or something. Magna, magnus, meaning large and big in Latin in that case. Um, and as I said, slightly plagiarizing, in the heading for the, uh, this topic, I said King John, uh, a, great, uh, a bad king, but a great charter. Uh, we perhaps, to make it more interesting, we should have put a question mark at the end of there. A bad king, a great charter, things to be kind of debated, which I hope we'll discuss today. And I do think that, for example, uh, John's reputation is uh, as a sort of bad king. And as I described before, there's been no subsequent people who've become king of England who've been called John. That name is kind of a negative one. Um, John's reputation is a little bit unfair. Okay? He was a product of his own circumstances, his own life, uh, and the events surrounding his reign, and to some extent, events uh, beyond his control. But uh, he has a personal reputation uh, as a person that is uh, seen as negative, and his reign is connected with a number of big things. We said Magna Carta being the one of them, which is either seen as a positive thing, if you want to say, here is something, the beginning of the process of democracy, and we'll debate that later on, um, but obviously a bad thing as far as it's against him, I suppose. Uh, secondly, during his reign, we see the loss of Normandy, um, when during to various circumstances, the French king, uh, Philip Augustus, is able to get his hands on Normandy. And obviously for kind of Normans, uh, Angevins as Norman heirs, the loss of Normandy, which was their original paternal inheritance, is a significant thing. So he lost Normandy to the French, in a sense. Uh, and he did various other things in connection with these events. And also, during his reign, the Pope, I think it was uh, Innocent III, placed England under, in, under interdict, where technically you can't do religious church ecclesiastical things in the kingdom because of an argument they had uh, that was ongoing and so on. But of course, uh, for example, as I shall say later on, if we take some of these uh, together, or particularly the first uh, one, Magna Carta, um, elements in Magna Carta were taken from earlier documents, some dating from the reign of Henry I. So some of the things in there uh, are going back to earlier uh, statements and ideas. And as we've seen before, uh, John was not the first English king to have a big argument with uh, the popes. We saw what happened uh, under his father's reign uh, in particular. So putting it all together and then giving a kind of negative twist, it seems as if uh, he was a bad king, but each individual one could be argued one way or the other and debated, and I'm sure historians will continue to do these things from now on. So let me just say a little bit about the background, because I, I'm, I presume, Marty, you're going to focus on his reign as king, yes? Are you going to say much about before he becomes king? Yes. You are, about right. Right, about his family. Okay, well, may maybe, okay, maybe to give you more time and to avoid repetition, uh, I'll let you uh, take over. I'll just make one last point then about his kind of general background and then I will move in so I won't repeat too much. Uh, as I noticed on Marta's uh, presentation, and again, I'm sorry for anticipating, uh, like a number of, like many medieval kings, he had a one or a number of nicknames, and one of the earliest and most well-known ones is Lackland, John Lackland, which means he lacked land, because he was the youngest son of Henry II. At a, an earlier phase, he was not really given any significant inheritance, unlike his older brothers, though as they all slowly died off, of course, his situation improved. But I think, again, looking at it from a personal perspective, if you are in a competitive and uh, hierarchical environment as the sort of medieval monarchy was, and if you are at the bottom of that as the youngest son, I think it's fair to say 
uh, he will have, as we say in England, a certain chip on his shoulder, a certain number of, uh, of issues uh, to deal with. And obviously he had to fight hard to um, assert his position against his older brothers, uh, at least before they died. Uh, and so uh, what happens later during the reign of his brother uh, Richard the Lionheart, and then in his own reign, is perhaps an extension of that, that he was just used to pressing his case against other people. Okay? If he'd been born with a large inheritance as one of the older brothers, maybe he would have had a different, slightly different kind of perspective on, on how to uh, deal with his life and so on. So, um, not as kind of simple and straightforward, he's the bad guy, and that's the end of it, I think, as, uh, as we could see. But we'll see to, wait to see what Marta has to say. She may or may not uh, agree with me there, and we can discuss that. Right. Um, in the next class, we're going to discuss Magna Carta, as I said. Uh, so... To anticipate that class, I ask the question, firstly, have you all got the text of Magna Carta with you? I gave you the uh, link online uh, for that, I think. And have you all read Magna Carta in preparation for, well, now it's today. We would have done this last week uh, or maybe on Tuesday. Hmm? You don't have a copy. Anyone else? Right, so you get half a point for printing, but not for uh, bringing or something. I don't remember the link in the... Right, you haven't got the link in the blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Sorry? Well, it must be on the bibliography, so... Yeah, as usual, whatever. Um. Zeynep? No? Okay. Because I obviously intend this to be a little bit more interactive. Uh, have you got the John one there? Which I, yeah, as one of you reminded me, I actually gave it twice because I gave it by mistake earlier on one occasion. Um, okay, what can we do here? Uh, here we have the Magna Carta. Now, it's not a short document by any means. Um, but... Uh, and this is one of these, this is this Fordham University site where they scan things so you occasionally get words all squashed together and things so that uh, if you're a native speaker of English, you kind of know what it's meant to be, but sometimes you think, what's that word or something like that? You might wonder what the household is, but that's one word. Um, now, how are we going to do this then? Um, we've got kind of 20 minutes until we're due to resume. I've read Magna Carta, I'm a good boy. Uh, so I'm allowed to go and buy my can of cola, uh, whatever, in, for the next 10 minutes. Um, so I can, we can, okay, you, we can nominate one of you to kind of scroll down, and then you can have a read of this. I don't know how we're going to do it. But if you've had some look at it, okay, um, let me just make sure you've read at least one part. If one of you will kind of... If you all read that, okay, and then one of you move, scroll down afterwards, uh, then um, uh, this, is, this is, in a sense, this, uh, the security clause, clause 61, is, is, the, is perhaps the most famous one, because this is the one where the kind of pseudo-democracy comes in. So have a read of that, okay, and one of you, when you're all finished the bottom, move it down, and then maybe you can kind of flick through, and we can do, I'll, do, I'll, I'll flick through it later on as well. But if you've got some ideas, then obviously we can have some discussion. Okay. Right. Thank you again, Marta. I shall go and buy my can of cola and leave you all here for a few minutes. Obviously, since you haven't actually read the text, then the amount of kind of feedback I can get uh, is a bit more limited. But we'll look at the clause uh, 61 later. Let's just quickly remind ourselves of the main points of John's reign, again, as... Um, uh, Marta was describing, okay. Uh, he has a succession struggle at the beginning, as many medieval kings had. Uh, and then, um, in the following year, when he is married to the heiress of uh, Anguem, uh, this leads to uh, an argument with her 
existing fiancé, as we saw, which then leads to uh, John being summoned to um, the French king's court. He refuses to go, so then he's seen as failing in his duty as a vassal, attending the court. And uh, we have um, uh, the beginning of the process of the loss of Normandy culminating <coughs> in uh, two, uh, 1204, as uh, we heard before. And he makes a number of attempts to kind of regain the lands, but uh, this doesn't come to very much. Then the next phase in his reign is the beginning of the struggle uh, with the papacy um, to do with who should become archbishop, replacement archbishop uh, of Canterbury. And we see the interdict and his excommunication. And the final real settlement only reached uh, towards the end of his reign in 12. Uh, 13, so um, that's one problem. <laughs> Moving more specifically towards um, Magna Carta itself, <sighs> the French are still, uh, the French king, uh, Philip Augustus, still has uh, his eye on England. Uh, having got Normandy and other lands uh, from John, and uh, an invasion is planned. But again, as Marta explained in her presentation, okay, the English under John have got a fairly significant uh, naval force power behind them, and they're able to uh, prevent the invasion. And then John takes the next step in going into France himself, Okay, trying to reassert himself, particularly in the south of his lands, but also obviously ultimately hoping to, I suppose, reassert uh, his previous uh, possessions and so on. And this is, very, this is a very important uh, stage in things. Um, however, by that point, perceptions within England, uh, to some extent, had changed. There was a different set of, of situations and perceptions amongst the noblemen, who, and I'm not very sure why, but when we deal with this period in particular, we always start to call them the barons rather than the noblemen. This word has kind of become uh, the standard one from its Latin baro in the singular, barones in the plural there. Um, so I'll use that word as well uh, occasionally. Uh, but a group of uh, barons uh, many of them with connections in the north of England, so they become known, uh, and there's a book on this subject as well, uh, as the Northerners, uh, though they also have connections with uh, Essex. Okay. Um, depending on how you look at it, they either s uh, resent uh, these French wars, that somehow they think the uh, fighting in France is um, is wasting time. That now longer, that now that England no longer controls Normandy directly, then what's going on in Aquitaine or something is not something that they should be uh, fighting for or providing knights for and so on. Uh, so there is a growing resentment against the king and his kind of foreign policy or whatever it might be seen as. And in addition, I suspect they had their own sort of more personal or selfish. Uh, aims as well. They were not sort of 100% doing things for uh, uh, ideological reasons, but they had their own uh, perspective on things. So we've got this problem building up. And that leads to uh, eventually in uh, the spring of 1215, uh, the barons uh, defy, the, uh, defy John, okay, and they begin uh, kind of negotiating with the French as well of things they can, they can do with the French. So they've got various plans uh, afoot and uh, f formally uh, renouncing their homage, formally uh, saying we are no longer going to be uh, vassals of this man uh, is perhaps the biggest step they, they try and make. This then leads to a series of events. We won't go into all the details. It's... Uh, uh, quite complicated and so on, but we see a series of struggles and a series of attempts at negotiating uh, between these groups of barons, the more extreme and some more moderate ones who join them, okay, against the king. Uh, and this uh, leads during the next few months 
to the creation of a number of documents, uh, peace documents and so on, okay? The most important, uh, on the 15th of June, a kind of draft Magna Carta, sometimes called the Article of Articles of the Barons, to which uh, John uh, eventually, uh, or John attached his seal and agreed to this. Uh, and then this is uh, sort of drawn up and finalized uh, a couple of days later in the final form with the proper seal as the Great Charter, okay, Magna Carta, as we said before. However, before we actually go and look at the document itself, okay, things break down very quickly. You might think, okay, now there's this big pseudo-democratic agreement or whatever it might be between um, the people and the king, or more likely, more accurately, the barons, some barons and the king, and everything should be kind of hunky-dory and everything's okay now, and he's agreed to be a good boy and so on. Um, but it's probably the case that uh, a good number of the barons were not entirely happy with this. They wanted more. They wanted to uh, go against the king even further. They wanted to, uh, ultimately perhaps, they wanted to have him removed. And so this kind of a deal was not what they wanted. So even though they'd agreed to this and even though it was official, they intended to, to carry on. And um, the Pope, remember, is the Lord of John at this point because of England being uh, made into a fief of the papacy. And he says, you know, this was, you were forced to agree to this kind of under duress, under pressure, and so you can actually break the terms of it as well. So in a sense, both sides, perhaps the king, who knows, but also at least some of the barons had no real intention of kind of sticking to what Magna Carta said and saying, okay, now we've fixed and we're at peaceful arrangements. Uh, and so uh, its importance for John's reign is rather limited because it didn't really have any direct effect upon what happened in England at that time. It, was, it represents more a kind of statement and uh, it gets taken up later, uh, both within a, a decade or so, but a long time later, its importance becomes kind of clear in people's minds. But as a practical thing, as a product of circumstances, it didn't really achieve very much. And then we get what's sometimes called uh, the First Barons' War, which I think Marta mentioned in her presentation, which is this kind of ongoing civil war, it carries on, okay? And the French come in under the uh, Prince uh, Louis, the king's son, uh, with the support of the barons, and uh, fighting goes one way or the other. And during all this, while all this is going on, unfortunately, John dies. I've got here of dysentery, again, of some kind of food poisoning. I didn't come across the ale or the peaches or the plums that Marta mentioned, but obviously doc documents will have different, but some kind of food poisoning or food stomach related uh, thing. And then obviously everything changes. Once he's dead, the whole situation is altered. So Magna Carta must be seen initially as a product of a series of events and situations within England rather than, as I said, seeing it as just as an abstract democratic statement of, of this and that. Uh, and we must understand that situation and the perspectives and views of the people. It's also not a simple document. It's also not something that was drawn up directly on, I don't know, the 15th of June or something. Uh, it incorporates a number of previous possible uh, discussions and negotiations and documents and even some material uh, going back to the reign of Henry I and so on. So it's not a, a single uh, sort of thing. It's a composite document of a number of sources and that tells us a lot. Uh, it's been suggested, for example, that the build-up uh, to uh, this from kind of May to June, uh, the build-up to the uh, final version the barons had basically made their demands, uh, which was their own, to some extent, selfish demands and concerns, particularly about feudal rights and so on. Um, but it's Stephen Langton, the archbishop, who is trying to perhaps, some people have suggested, put in other uh, clauses about the towns, there's even one about women and, and so on, to try and kind of fill out what it is and uh, to make it a more universal or, or general statement and so on. So again, the role of the barons is, I would suggest, a little bit more selfish than that. And if we break the document down, that we can't do that very easily, that, that's what we will see. A lot of the document is not just, this is what we want and it's against the king as well. It's not just some kind of attack on uh, royal power or something like that. It does a, 
a, a great number of different things and achieves uh, various things. It protects and preserves existing and old rights. It tries to restore certain things. It tries to prevent local officials, sheriffs and bailiffs, from abusing their position and things like that. So it's not all directed just against the king, though you could say these people are somehow part of the king's system. Um, as I said, some of it is not setting new things and moving forward, but just restoring or preserving existing relationships and rights and so forth. So again, that's quite an important point. And lastly, as a kind of general uh, point, um, uh, as I said before, we have to remember that uh, some of the people involved in this uh, on both John's side and on the other side, probably had no intention in the long run of kind of sticking to it. So uh, as an immediate product, it's rather limited in that sense as well. What it says, we don't say this is what happens, this is a fixed uh, set of things, and this is what England is like from that point onward. It's just a series of statements that may or may not, in some cases, were not uh, followed through. Okay, so let's have a little look at uh, Magna Carta itself. Okay, it breaks down into, it has a kind of similar, and it's called uh, the Carta, the Charter, and we've been looking at charters uh, in a previous classes, so we've got a, a rough idea of, of what they are, and uh, uh, there are certain fixed phrases and uh, formulas which come from, and we can recognize coming from, uh, uh, charters of the time and so on. Okay, so we have John at the beginning, his name. Okay, and we have a list of his uh, points. He's addressing uh, some people. Okay, to the archbishops, blah blah blah. In the same way that in charters we have someone who is addressing someone. In that case, it's usually those who are in, uh, present and in the future. It doesn't actually list these things, but kings usually address specific groups of people and so on. And then we have the usual phrase, okay, know that, be it known that, or whatever. Uh, and then he's giving something here, okay, to uh, a certain group of people, what with the assent of all these lists of names and so on, in the same way that charters involve, I'm giving this land with the assent of my um, uh, family and so forth. And here we have, okay, I have granted to God, okay, and by this present charter confirmed, uh, and uh, by, for us and for our heirs forever that, okay, uh, and these are free, these are uh, statements which we get in usual charters. So it's like a kind of a version of a charter, but it's not giving uh, a bit of land to someone in exchange for a service or a payment. Uh, it's a whole more complicated thing, and then it ends up at the end with a similar kind of formula as well. So it's like a big charter, but what it's doing is, is clearly rather different. But we did have at this time earlier and later as well uh, other kinds of charters which are called ch by modern historians, by historians, charters of liberties. And they were documents whereby uh, a king or nobleman uh, would give certain freedoms, certain rights often to towns in particular, okay? Towns, during this period, 12th and into the 13th century, towns were becoming increasingly important in uh, Western uh, Europe, and in this case, in uh, England. Uh, and there's a whole discussion about whether they are somehow separate from uh, the rural or feudal uh, greater part of the country, or whether they're kind of integrated in part of that. But towns are a place where Merchants lived where commerce went on, where manufacturing went on, and where different kinds of uh, land holding existed. And then the people of towns and towns in general were given certain rights that were kind of different from the rights of the countryside in order perhaps to allow them to do what they needed to do and so on. So um, we could even see this in that kind of a context as a very big Charter of Liberty or something like that in a, way, in a sense, but uh, in a very broad way. Okay, so the first uh, clause, I won't go through all 61 one by one, uh, but I'll jump around and pick a few interesting ones for us to perhaps discuss. The first one starts with the church. 
Okay. In the first place, we have granted to God, and by this our present charter confirmed for us and for our heirs forever, that the English church shall be free and shall have her rights entire and her liberties inviolate. Okay, cannot be uh, taken away. And we will that it uh, be thus observed, which is apparent from this, that the freedom of elections, which is reckoned most important and very essential to the English church, we of our pure and unconstrained will did grant and did by our charter confirmed uh, hang on, I, I haven't missed her. Confirmed uh, and uh, did obtain the ratification of the same from our Lord, Pope Innocent III, before the quarrel arose between us and our barons. And this we will observe, and our will is that it be observed in good faith by our heirs forever. We have also granted to all free men of our kingdom for us and for our heirs forever all the underwritten liberties uh, to be had and to be held uh, by them and their heirs of us and our heirs uh, forever. Okay, this is the other ones down here. But it starts, interestingly enough, and this must be, I'm sure, the work of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton. It starts with a, a general statement about the freedom of the church. Okay, we've seen that uh, John had this big argument with the Pope, though now they're best buddies, of course, because he's his lord and he's his vassal and so on. But uh, it begins with that statement. Before we actually get to the things that the barons are concerned with directly, we have this issue here. Then we have a series of uh, clauses relating in particular to kind of feudal issues, things to do with uh, the feudal structure. These go on for a while. We won't go into all of these. Um, if any of our earls or barons or other uh, others holding of us in chief by night service shall die, and at his death his heir be a full age and owe relief, we shall, uh, he shall have his inheritance on the payment of the ancient relief, namely the heir or the heirs of an earl, blah, 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 and it gives the figures and so on. What is this saying? What's this little clause here about? Uh, the second one. Though. It's saying that, um, if that if the earl or baron dies in the military service, it's basically guaranteeing that their heir will... Um, Yes, I mean, um, technically, of course, uh, a thief as a feudal, uh, feudum as a holding, uh, should go back, should revert to the Lord when someone dies. If I grant some land to Özge uh, as a thief, then when she dies, it goes back to me. But that's the kind of technical thing. But in most cases, uh, by this point, definitely, okay, heirs expected to become automa fairly automatically through certain payments or whatever and so on, they would expect to become the, uh, the heirs of the fief as well. So we've got here uh, uh, the, the guarantee uh, of this. Okay. And number three, if, however, the heir of any of the aforesaid uh, had been under a, has been underage and in wardship, let him have his inheritance without relief and without <coughs> fine when he comes of age. Anyone who is like a young boy, okay, so he cannot at that point inherit, okay, uh, and that means in wardship he has a ward, a guardian, means literally, uh, then the rules are slightly different and he can get his um, uh, fief immediate when he comes of age later on and so on, okay. And then that deals, the same thing carries on here, the ward and the guardian uh, are, are, are mentioned there. Um, there's a bit about marriage coming up somewhere. I think number six, where is that? Uh, heir shall be married without disparagement, yet so that before ma the marriage takes place, the nearest in blood to that heir shall uh, have notice. A widow after the death of her husband shall forthwith and without difficulty have her marriage portion and her inheritance. Okay, this is to do with property and so on. Uh, nor shall uh, she give anything of her dower, of her dowry, uh, or for her marriage portion, or for the inheritance which her husband and she held on the day of the death of that husband, blah, 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 and so on. So here again is looking at not just heirs, but also uh, what happens with wives in particular uh, are being dealt with here. These and other parts of Magna Carta are just, we could suggest, are just trying to preserve the... Uh, existing rights, feudal rights, which obviously the barons in particular wanted to protect. Um, uh, inheritance of fiefs, 
uh, and so forth and other things. Um, it was in their interests, in their economic interests to, uh, to do that. So um, they're not here at this point trying to somehow radicalize or change English society. All they're doing is, uh, is trying to preserve their rights uh, as they saw it uh, uh, and, um, and make sure that they get what they want. So they're not doing anything kind of greatly democratic here in that sense. That's uh, in my view anyway. Some interesting things coming up here, number 10 and 11, relating to Jews. We mentioned we had a reference to the Jews when we looked at, um, I think it was Richard, wasn't it? Uh, if one who has borrowed from the Jews any sum, small or great, die before that loan can be repaid, the debt shall not bear interest while the heir is under age, of whomsoever he, sh he may hold. And if the debt falls into our hands, that's the king's, the state, we will not take anything except the principal sum contained in the bond. And if anyone die indebted to the Jews, his wife shall have her dower, a dowry, and pay nothing of that debt. Blah, blah, blah. Now, um, do we understand, this is kind of going beyond the focus of what we're doing, but do we understand what the significance of, or the reason why these two uh, clauses are put in here with reference to Jews? What's the importance for medieval Europe of the Jews? What's their situation here? Orthodox Christian, Catholic Christian. Yeah, an orthodox yeah. in the lowercase O, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, what are we dealing with here? What's the, what are the Jews doing in these two? Sorry? They're money lenders. Now, why in medieval Europe did Jews become money lenders? Why do we have the beginning of this stereotype? Because they don't have the right to have an They don't have to have something on the shape, uh, building well, or home or what's, I forgot the term. Yeah, okay, I don't know. Um, it's less to do with what they cannot have as what they can have or what they can do in a way. Uh, the Christian church in the Middle Ages believed that lending money and making interest, so charging extra on top, okay, was a bad thing. Okay, you shouldn't do that. And you would be excommunicated if you did that. If you lent money to someone, here's 10 lira, but you have to give me 15 lira ne next week or something. Okay? And you would be excommunicated for doing that, for practicing this. But, of course, that rule didn't extend to Jews because Jews were not Christians. So if the Pope said, I'm excommunicating you, it doesn't make any difference because they don't believe in that anyway. So the Pope has no power kind of you know, emotionally or religiously over the Jews. So uh, there was a gap in the society because people wanted to get money. They could re receive money, they could invest it, do something with it, and if, as long as it accumulated capital, they could pay back the debt and still make their own profit. There was a gap in the market, in a sense, in the society, um, which Christians were not able to fill, and the Jews came to fill that because they were not forbidden to do it technically, in a sense, or they could not be punished uh, according to the religious rules of the time. And so, by this point, by the central Middle Ages, okay, in a large part of Western Europe, and I suppose elsewhere, um, uh, people of Jewish ancestry living there uh, did have this important function within the society, which then gains this negative attitude because no one likes to pay money back and give more back than they were taken and so on and we get all these problems and so forth. But even here in Magna Carta, it's felt necessary to point out that if you've borrowed from the Jews, okay, and then you die, your, uh, your wife or your heir doesn't have to pay everything back, they just have to pay the lump sum, the original sum, okay. Uh, they don't have to pay from other things. So they're concerned with, uh, with that. They're even regulating that. And in a sense, I mean, where does the king fit in that? That's not something attacking the king necessarily, I suppose. It's, a, it's, another, it's another kind of issue. It's a way of regulating the society and so on. Uh, 13, I've written down here. 13, and the city of London shall have all of its ancient liberties and free customs. Okay, the idea that towns have got special rights 
as well by land as by water. Furthermore, we decree and grant that all other cities, boroughs, towns and ports shall have their liberties and free customs. So we're moving from the feudal sphere into the kind of town sphere here. And either here or later on, we get references to merchants and things like that as well. We might come across those if we've got time uh, later on. See if I can find anything of interest. Okay, I'm going to jump quite a long way down to 23 now. 24. Let's look at 24. No sheriff, constable, coroners, uh, or others of our bailiffs uh, shall hold pleas of our crown, and so on. And this is one of a number of um, uh, ones that relate to the actions of, of, uh, of officials and things like this. Okay, so we're controlling not just the king at the top, but the people below him within the hierarchy what they can and what they cannot do as well. So there's a fear, obviously, of abuse of these things uh, uh, in theory and so on. Um, we move back on to inheritance after that, I see. And then uh, 28, we have more officials. That's a good one. No constable or other bailiff of ours shall take corn or other provisions from anyone without immediately tendering money therefor, unless he can have postponement thereof by permission of the seller. What's this saying here? What What is the... Uh, what are the um, constables and bailiffs being allowed and not allowed to do in this one? Yeah, essentially you have to, you, you cannot uh, take things in kind, corn and other uh, produce, and just say, okay, this is for uh, me or this is for the king or whatever it might be without at least paying for it, unless the uh, the peasant or whatever it might be kind of agrees to that the, uh, uh, beforehand. Uh, again, this is preventing local officials, people well below the king, uh, from abusing their positions of power in that sense, which obviously is important. An interesting little one here. Okay, um, and it's got different words in the two different wo versions I've got. Number 33, all kittles, and in my printed version, it says fish weir. Uh, hang on, that should be the eye there, of course. All kittles for the future shall be removed altogether from the Thames and Medway and throughout all England, except upon the seashore. Does anyone know what a weir is? Jengis, do you know that word? Is that something you've come across? A weir? Yes, a, a weir itself is a way of kind of blocking up the water and controlling where the water goes and so on. Uh, like with, uh, I suppose you could almost, I mean, with, with when you're trying to control the levels of parts of the river and so on. But a fish weir is one which controls, catches the fish as they come along and things like that. And obviously here, we're at the, uh, this must be the word for it. In my, book, in my printed translation, this here, kiddle, must be the technical word for, for those things. So on the rivers, Thames and Medway, okay, in the south of England, they must have got a lot of these fish weirs where people are, are getting the fish and presumably preventing people further up the river from catching those fish themselves, whatever. And this is seen as, as a sort of abuse of your position or whatever. And again, uh, I don't know whether these kiddles were kind of, you know, encouraged by the king or not, but it seems to me we're quite a well below the things that King John is concerned that he's concerned with Normandy and Aquitaine and these kind of things, not with uh, necessarily with weirs on the Thames or whatever. So um, we're, we're moving into a different kind of a realm at this point. And we move forward, we carry on down, we get uh, standardization of, of weights and measures of weighing and measuring things in England. We come on to the merchants again. Um, but before that, well, we've got an interesting one about freemen, 39 should be at the top here. But no free man, liber homo uh, in Latin, shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will he go uh, upon him, uh, nor will we go upon him, nor send upon him, except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the la law of the land and so on. So this is, in a sense, uh, what becomes known as a habeas corpus, free uh, f freedom of the body and so on, that you've, you, know, you cannot be kind of mistreated uh, unless this is somehow within the law of the land. Okay? 
and no one uh, and to no one uh, will we sell nor to no one will we refuse or deny right or or justice very kind of simple statements there put in it's an interesting sort of mixture of these of these things then we come back onto the merchants we talked about towns before and then we come on to merchants coming up somewhere here okay but these are presumably kind of um, number 41 I wanted here uh, all merchants uh, sh shall have safe and secure exit from England and entry to England uh, with the right to tarry there and to move about as well by land as by water for buying and selling by the ancient and, and right customs uh, quit from all evil tolls except in time of war such merchants uh, as are of the land uh, at war with us so what are we getting here what are we saying for the merchants for the commercial guys what are we what are we seeing here being stated yeah in order to do their business which is basically taking stuff from one place, whether it's within England or uh, to a foreign country and coming back, okay? Uh, they will have freedom of movement. They will not be taxed as they go away, okay? The evil tolls that are mentioned. Except if we're at war with that country, if the French merchants are coming, then we might uh, think about that one again, okay? They're concerned about these issues and obviously they don't want sort of suspicious foreigners wandering around in the country and so on seems fairly kind of reasonable and so on and it carries on we've got more feudal things we've got things about forests we've got more uh, local officials coming in and so on things like that um, a lot of these things relatively kind of uh, reasonable I would sus I suspect okay um, uh, now where's the one about oh, there's a very short thing about women I wanted to see what this translate how this translation is different from mine I think it may be very similar number 54 here no one shall be ar arrested or imprisoned upon the appeal of a woman uh, for the death of any other than her husband what is this saying this is one of the few cases where women get mentioned apart from as uh, again as wives though in a sense what do we think this is saying? I can see where you've got that from. I think that's not quite... No, her, her, in theory, her husband is dead in this one, okay, in one possible scenario, which is the end thing. Um, the, what is the woman doing? She has no right to... Uh, to, now can I say, to blame someone or happen to blame of a woman. No one can be arrested or can be put in prison. Yeah, it, I... I I've got a whole thing I'm kind of misunderstanding it, but that's what it seems to be saying, uh, except in the case of her husband. If her husband is killed or whatever, then she can say, he did it, or whatever, okay? But uh, in other cases, the woman seems to have lost her right to, to do that, okay? Which uh, obviously is a rather sexist thing. I mean, from our modern perspective, perhaps not so sexist from, from the perspective of the time and so on. Uh, and then it moves forward. We have some things dealing with Wales and Scotland. Um, we've already had some, a bit more about foreigners as we, as we go along. Um, so covering various things. Let's finish off then by looking at what's called the security clause uh, 61, which I left you to read before. Um, so we won't read through all of this now because it's quite long. But what, what is this important clause and this is one of the things where people this is the thing that we grab onto and say oh this is somehow the beginnings of democracy and so on what what's going on in this clause here what's it providing for or allowing so what, from what I got from it is basically limiting the power of the king and giving the barons um, more say over what goes on and then it uh, finishes by uh, basically guaranteeing it in the future. Yeah. Um, which barons? Let's start with that question. I mean, it doesn't say any specific names, but it says these. Yeah, 5 and 20. So. Yeah, 25 barons. Uh, and how are they picked or chosen? I'm assuming they're the barons who originally had the quarrel with the king. 
Yeah. <laughs> they, well, I don't know how many of them there were. I mean, there were probably more than 20. No, I mean, this could be any. They, they fix a number. There will be some kind of a group in the future carrying on, kind of in theory, forever, it seems to be saying. Uh, and at any one time, there should be 25 noblemen, okay, uh, who uh, have this special rule, role. We'll come out to what the role is in a minute. And, sorry? Take your hands away from your mouth. And, yeah, okay, we may or may not argue that that might be feeding into that, and we'll see further similar kind of stages next week when we look at uh, Henry III's reign. But um, we've got a group of selected barons who choose themselves. I, I can't see where exactly it says that here, but uh, they're chosen from amongst the barons by themselves, the, the group of barons. So they're not chosen by the king. Okay? And these people have uh, certain functions. Before this time, as we said uh, the past few weeks ago, we had um, the king had a kind of council around him of advisors, churchmen and noblemen primarily, who, whom he chose okay, to give him advice and to do certain things for him and so on. This emerges from the household in a sense. This is something very, very different from what most medieval kings had. This is a separate group of people who's being appointed independently of the king okay, uh, and uh, is given certain powers and rights. And this group of people is uh, self-chosen. Okay. And there should always be 25, it says. There should always be uh, more. So what, what are these guys doing? What do these 24, 25 barons have to do? I think I've gone slightly too far here. Well, yes, the, the provisions in this document and other rights have to be protected. And somewhere, and I'm trying to see where it is, it says basically if, if anything is transgressed, if anything is broken, if anything is done badly by me or my representatives or whatever, then as long as four of the barons know about it, this is what I'm trying to find, four barons have to be kind of familiar with this from the 25, then, yes, then these four shall repair to us or our <coughs> justicia if we're not here, and lay the transgressions before us, petition to have the transgression redest without delay. So if something's happened to uh, Chara, some terrible bailiff has taken some of his land or something again, uh, and the four of the barons become familiar with this, then uh, this transgression, this breaking of the rule of the charter uh, should be brought to the king, and then he should make sure that, uh, that things are repaired, that things are, are fixed accordingly. And there's a thing, it comes up here, but this format is not very uh, clear, so I might try I can find in my own, because I've marked it here, it's quite important, okay. Um, and then uh, the king has to deal with this within 40 days. There's a 40 day period to, to make sure that Chara's lands or whatever it is are restored to him. And then if that's not done properly, okay, then uh, it talks about, um, the 25 barons with the commune of all the land, okay, uh, the community of all the land, so now the barons are in theory kind of representing everywhere, can uh, distrain and distress the king, okay, which again is a common medieval way. If someone's broken the law, you can take, legally you can take some of their stuff away, okay, which is what we've got here, okay. This is together with the community of the whole land, distrain and distress us in all possible ways. So to make us agree to solve the problem for Chara, we have to, they will deprive us of our lands or castles, whatever it might be. And people will swear an oath to the five barons, not to the king, which is interesting. There is an oath that is sworn to these five barons. And if one of them dies, final important point, then the barons will choose another one, okay? And there's a reference later on to majority voting, the decision of the majority. Okay, so this is the kind of perhaps either most important or at least most famous uh, of the um, clauses. And in the long run, 
uh, the most important one, but perhaps for people at the time, things to do with fishing weirs and things were more important. But uh, in our kind of modern perspective, this one obviously uh, is very, very important. Um, and you can obviously see where we're going. I mean, again, we had the idea of the House of Lords, that these barons are a kind of origin for the House of Lords or something like that. Um, do you think this is the case from what we've just read here? We haven't read the whole thing in detail, but do you think we can see something going on here which is at least stands in a very slightly ancestral and distant uh, way to what would be called modern democratic structures in England or elsewhere in the way that we see these things presented in Turkish high schools and so on? Is this? No? Why not? Because it's still, even though it's not the king, it's still the upper, upper class who's controlling it. And it's not so much the people in general. All right, well, that's, that's, the, that's the true definition of democracy. But then ancient Greek democracy was not democratic by our standards. No. American democracy as founded by the founding fathers excluded the blacks or whatever and so on. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, democracy has got a slow history. I still have very much say in it to begin with. I mean, to me, it just seems like nobles trying to gain power. Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously, the, sorry, okay, you want to... Clauses, clauses yeah. uh, of the uh, Magna Carta, the uh, barons uh, seem uh, to take uh, some concessions from the king uh, about the liberty of trade uh, and uh, movement, uh, liberty of movement uh, when uh, doing trade and some the, uh, fish. Uh, the fish yeah, weirs, fish yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the king was giving some co concessions uh, for the barons, and this clause is. Uh, a, um, a kind of clause uh, that uh, that controls uh, not uh, giving all the power to the barons, but a kind of uh, watch over uh, the barons, not uh, for the uh, well-being and democratic needs of the citizens, but uh, the king gave something, and the barons maybe here uh, kind of. Yes, I mean I don't think. Yeah, I mean I agree with what you're saying and what Jengi says. I think. Uh, I, I haven't read every single document relating to Magna Carta and so on, but uh, I, I think to present it as some kind of, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is trying to sort of protect the people, though we have that reference to the community or commune of the land and so on there, uh, which is interesting. But primarily these people were looking after their own interests, feudal, commercial, because they, they were getting, uh, they, it was in their interest that merchants and towns worked well and so on as well. So. Uh, they were protecting their interests against what they saw as uh, an overpowerful monarchy, which it had been building up uh, under the Angevins, and then John obviously uh, uh, causing his own extra confusion to that. And so um, they were trying to redress that, reestablish certain things, and then to provide some kind of guarantee. Uh, whatever. And again, like in any charter, we said, remember we went back to looking at charters there, we had the warranty clause at the end, I guarantee this, blah, 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 and so on. And this kind of almost acts like that. But it is something new, okay? It's stressing that the king is kind of not above the law and that there are these controls and checks upon what the king can do, which in practice there always is, because people will always do something against the king. It's, he's not the first king that people were fighting against, but this is kind of putting something down in paper and trying to formalize it. And I think it's, it is interesting exactly what they thought and what it was meant to be doing and whether they even intended it to really work is another thing. Jenkins? Did it only apply to um, his lands in like, England proper, or did this apply to like, his lands? Had left in France or in Ireland? I, this, this was primarily the English situation, yeah, yeah I think. But the deals it mentions a little bit about dealing with the Welsh and Scottish rulers, but uh, that's a different issue. But in terms of places mentioned, England is the, is the key here. And I, don't, the, the, I don't know the future history behind it, but do the later kings follow this or do they get rid of it? Do they use some of it? Um, well, we might mention this again next week or the week after, depending on when we do Henry the Third. But um, it is kind of reissued under Henry uh, a couple of times. 
with certain bits, I think including this bit, maybe missed out. Uh, and then it recurs later on, it becomes, bits of it become part of kind of English legal tradition and things like that. Um, so that's why it's interesting. So it has a significance kind of later, but in fact at the time itself things kind of get, it pretty much gets ripped up almost straight away because the civil war kind of carries on or, or starts afresh in a way and it's clear that John's trying to get past it and a lot of the barons had no intention of kind of stopping there as I explained before. So uh, it, has a, it has a significance uh, and it gains bigger significance as a kind of constitutional ideological idea as we said and uh, it's cited and things like that quite a lot. I had a look um, at the Wikipedia entry for this earlier on, because uh, you should always look at Wikipedia, and it's very interesting that it has very little about the actual document, and it's all to do with its later image and things like that, which is quite interesting, but obviously of no significance directly for us today as well. So, yeah, that would be a, a fuller answer to your question. Okay, let's stop there then. Uh